Welcome to lecture number six of the course Introduction to Data Science. Today we are going to talk about uh, neural networks. Actually, we will talk about this uh, in two lectures. Uh, today I will uh, explain lots of the background and I will also uh, explain the architecture of a neural network. In the next lecture we will uh, uh, look in more detail at mechanisms like uh, backpropagation. So neural networks uh, gained a lot of attention, let's say in the last 10 years. Uh, many innovations have become uh, possible. However, what you will see in this lecture, uh, in a way it's a natural continuation of the things that we saw earlier in, in the context of logistic regression and, and SVMs. Okay, so what are we going to do today? First, we, uh, we introduce uh, the topic. We relate it also a bit to human uh, neural networks. Um, we explain the layout. We show that there are different uh, architectures, uh, but we stick with the very simple feedforward uh, networks. At the end, I will uh, also uh, explain informally how backpropagation works, but this will be discussed in more detail uh, in the next lecture. Uh, there is lots of material on, on uh, deep learning, neural network, and, and let's say machine learning in this uh, specific sense. Uh, so if you browse online, you can find a lot of information. Uh, so let's start with an introduction to, to neural networks. So uh, they are also a technique mostly used for supervised learning. Uh, and as I said, they are related to regression and support vector machines. So what, what we have seen so far are uh, uh, basically error-based learning techniques. So techniques that, let's say, iteratively try to reduce the error. Yeah, so for example, in the context of regression, we look at, let's say, reducing the error by, let's say, walking down the mountain uh, uh, in the direction indicated by the derivatives. Um, so neural networks are also, uh, let's say, error-based learning. And in the way that we will talk about them today, uh, they are positioned also as a supervised learning technique, which we feed with many examples. And then we want it to predict, uh, uh, to classify uh, instances based on the descriptive features uh, uh, with a high reliability based on what they had seen before. Okay, so as I just explained, uh, we start with the classification problem. So the idea is that we feed the neural network with lots of pictures of cats and dogs. And then if we have trained it, we can take a fresh Im image of a of a dog or a cat, and uh, we want the neural network uh, to identify whether it's a dog or a cat or something else. So that's the basic idea, and a five-year-old child can do it, and it's intriguing, uh, let's say, how children are able to do this, and that for algorithms this is very difficult in general, because the input is very uh, unstructured. In a way, no two dogs look exactly uh, the same. Um, so, as I mentioned, this is related to logistic regression. So I show some slides that I had uh, been showing before. Uh, so if we have a simple linear classification, uh, here I, I have two uh, uh, descriptive variables. I have one target variable uh, plus or, or the, 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 the class represented by the triangle. Uh, so good and faulty in this example, and we try to find the separating plane uh, to separate one class from the other class, dogs from cats. Uh, if we look at logistic regression uh, uh, and, and SVMs, like that was also the basic idea. So uh, sometimes we need to lift the number of dimensions uh, because we do not have a linear dependency. And, uh, for example, in the lecture on regression, we had rainfall, where we were also looking at rain to the power 2 uh, to fit, let's say, more uh, complicated uh, shapes. Uh, in the le lecture on SVMs, we explained kernels uh, that provide a shortcut 
uh, to deal with, let's say, higher dimensional. Uh, uh, we, we lift the input vector to something that has many more dimensions, but we find the shortcut in such a way that we can do this also efficiently. Uh, note here we have the uh, we are trying to maximize the safety margin, but allow for some error, uh, and we have this constant c. As I'm just refreshing some of the things that we had seen before, and what you see here is that uh, we lift the number of dimensions in both examples to be able to fit data that may look like this. Uh, we cannot do that with a linear function. Um, if you look at neural networks, the basic idea is to, to not make the functions more complicated, but to have a network of neurons uh, dealing with this in a kind of automatic way. Because the difficulty of the things that we have seen in the lecture on regression and the lecture on SVMs is that we need to use a lot of domain knowledge to decide how to lift the number of dimensions to kind of fit to these nonlinear uh, shapes. So, uh, and now using a kind of representation, which we will later also see in the context of neural networks, that is kind of bridging the lecture uh, on logistic regression and the lecture on SVMs to the lecture uh, today. So X is the input vector, uh, then we can uh, use this function to transform it to something with more dimensions if we want. Yeah, so uh, we don't need to do that. And then uh, this would simply uh, mean that we look at the JF, JF element of the vector. Uh, we have a weight vector uh, where WJ refers to the weight at the J uh, position. Uh, then we sum over all of this and then we apply a function. So initially, when we were introducing uh, the topic of logistic regression, we had a function that was, let's say, uh, a kind of binary. Yeah? So uh, if it was above or below a certain value, for example, zero, it would return zero or one. Uh, we also use the sigmoid function to make it more uh, she uh, to make it more smooth to align to allow for let's say uh, computing the gradient and to decide in which direction uh, to walk. So in this example, we have uh, m descriptive features, and in a way, we just have one layer. As always, I would like to point out because we are using uh, different books, different articles. Uh, and the topic of, uh, of data science is very broad. Uh, there are slight notational variances, and that's why I'm always repeating often things that I have said before to make sure that the notation is clear to you. Uh, if you understand this, then this will help you to link what we have seen before to the things that we will talk about later. Uh, we already explained the idea of gradient uh, descent. I uh, talked about this uh, extensively, and if we are uh, computing the derivatives of the error function, we know in which direction we can walk down. Uh, the only thing that we need to decide is that if we know the direction how we can go down, we need to decide the step size. If the step size is too small, it may take a very long time to converge uh, to the global minimum. If we take the step size uh, too big, we have the risk of overshooting. Yeah, that we make too big steps, that we kind of jump over uh, the uh, lowest point that we are trying to find. So that's why typically you start with bigger steps and end with, uh, with smaller steps. So that's the principle of gradient descent. Uh, and if we talk about uh, backpropagation in the context of uh, uh, neural networks, we will basically use exactly the same mechanism. And that's why I'm refreshing this. Uh, so the basic idea of, of uh, neural networks is that rather than uh, using domain knowledge to have this function lifting our input to something that has higher dimensions or something that is non-linear uh, and then to do it in one step, 
Yeah, that, that's what we did before when we were talking, for example, about uh, uh, SVMs and logistic re regression. What we are doing now in the context of neural network, this like mapping to higher dimensions is a network. Yeah, so we have a network composed of multiple layers. Uh, uh, and every layer, you can think of that as a function in the, in, in, in the way that, that we have seen it before. So we are replacing this by this. Uh, we will explain this uh, later in, in more detail how this uh, works exactly, but this is to connect already a bit to the things that we have seen before. I will explain all the symbols, uh, uh, let's say, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so, what are typical applications? If typical applications of neural networks are, uh, are, let's say, applications where the input data is not very structured. So this could be image, this could be speech, this could be text. Uh, and we, we use a lot of training uh, examples and then we want to answer the question, uh, is this a dog, dog or not? And of course, this is a dog, it is our dog Miffy. But how can we train a neural network to actually do this? That's the question. So what we see is our dog Miffy. Uh, what the computer sees is something like this. And so a picture in essence is just a bunch of pixels. Uh, and this is what the camera sees. Uh, so it's, it's important to often realize that, that there are these, let's say, uh, that all, all of our examples, they look at uh, very few inputs, but here you see, let's say, that the input of uh, a single picture can be huge. Yeah, so we have a huge number of features, uh, and the breakthroughs in machine learning are due to the fact that we can handle these massive amounts of, uh, of features. And we could not do that before. Uh, this is another example, this is a, a character, this is also a st standard training set uh, uh, being used to, let's say, introduce these types of techniques. Uh, so here we have a, a certain character that represents an 8, and the computer sees this. Uh, it sees a, an 80 by 18 a pixel uh, image, uh, so, so the, uh, it's just a, a sequence of numbers. So whenever we talk about neural networks, you should think of the input vector as something like this. Um, so this is, as I said, taken from a, from a training set. So uh, the basic idea is that each of the handwritten numbers that you see here uh, has on the one hand this representation, this let's say pixel representation, uh, on the other hand, uh, we know it's an 8, we know it's a 0. So if we look at our, our let's say, our, uh, our training example, we basically have uh, a bunch of vectors, and every vector uh, is, let's say, an, a, an array of, let's say, hundreds of, of numbers, uh, and we know what it should be. Yeah, so the first one should be an 8, the second one should be a 2, the third one should be a 7, so we can use this as training examples. And you, you can see that there is a 7 here, there is a 7 here, we see different zeros. And we now train uh, a network to be able to recognize uh, this. Uh, so if we look at, we just saw images, but you can imagine that we can convert, for example, sound and video in a similar way. And also text can be seen as something uh, unstructured. As of course, the text can be simply encoded. Uh, uh, you can view it as an array of characters. But there are later in the lectures on text mining, we see that there are also things that are very specific for text. But for now, whatever input we look at, we just see it as an input vector. And the elements of the input vector may correspond to, uh, I don't know, to pixels, to to to, to to the, the volume, whatever we can think of. Uh, so an artificial network takes this as input. So here, and I said that is the, uh, the misleading thing of, of let's say, whenever you try to introduce neural networks, 
And so we here just have four inputs. And so you can think of this as the picture would only have four pixels. And so this is not very meaningful. You should think of that the input can have, uh, let's say, million, and mil can be composed of millions of numbers. And then we have the output, and the output could be, I don't know, dog, cat, or it could be a number, as we've seen in the, in the example before. And the network is trained in such a way to convert these inputs to the specific outputs. We train it on a large number of examples, and then we hope that it behaves in this way. Uh, so artificial neural networks are using this mechanism, and I think you have a basic idea how this functions, uh, and this is inspired by biological neural networks, yes, uh, and that's where most of the terms come from. Uh, also as a human, you basically train by getting lots of examples and uh, people expecting you to respond in a particular way. With some people this is successful, with other people uh, it is not. So, although this relationship to, between artificial neural networks and biological neural networks is often, let's say, emphasized, in reality there are quite some differences. Uh, so you should, what I'm going to say on the next couple of slides, you should take that relationship with a grain of salt. Uh, so if we look at the historical perspective, then it's surprising, although neural networks became, let's say, in fashion only, let's say, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, the ideas uh, go back uh, a very long time. And so there is this famous article at 1943, uh, where uh, two persons, let's say, describe the first artificial neuron. Of course, in a time where, uh, uh, where it was impossible to implement anything of the things that are uh, described in this paper. So that, one could argue, that is the starting point uh, of this field. Uh, if we look at AI, so AI is broader, much broader than, uh, let's say, the notion of neural networks. If you look at uh, artificial intelligence, it's a very vague Uh, described uh, concept uh, and you could see that there, uh, for a very long time there were two uh, branches uh, the logic inspired branch of AI focusing on reasoning yeah, like rule based systems and stuff like that uh, based on, on, on logic and there was the biologically inspired uh, uh, let's say branch that was focusing not so much on reasoning, but more on learning based on many examples. Yeah, so here you can see some differences. So the logic-inspired branch uses symbolic rules and uh, is, is kind of programming these rules. If we look at the biologically inspired forms of learning, what this lecture is about, uh, uh, it is basically trained on, on, on large amounts of data without having very explicit or specific uh, or sophisticated rules. Uh, for a very long time, uh, this second branch was not successful at all. Right? The, the main focus was on this reasoning uh, uh, branch. Uh, uh, there were also like high expectations on, on what we could do with this more logic-inspired branch or, of artificial intelligence, but many of the attempts uh, failed. Yeah, so, for example, there was a, a real hype on, for example, things called expert systems, uh, but they were basically a complete uh, failure. Uh, that, that they did not uh, uh, deliver on, on the promises that they generated. Uh, if we look at this second branch, the branch which was not based on reasoning, but more on learning based on lots uh, of examples, uh, for a very long time was not competitive at all. Yeah, so uh, these techniques would not uh, work uh, very well. Uh, uh, however, this shifted, let's say, 15 to 10 years ago, when certainly, certainly let's say, these neural networks uh, became let's say, really competitive and started to, let's say, uh, defeat, let's say, many of the other uh, approaches. 
Why was that the case? I think that's the combination of, let's say, improvements in the computing power that we are able to deal with, let's say, these large collections of examples. I think that was one reason. There were also, let's say, uh, new mechanisms introduced, like, for example, backpropagation, and that, 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 that somehow became applicable, uh, things that were not applicable before. So this is a, a, a historic view. I also show some more uh, pictures on that. Uh, that gives you a bit of a time perspective. Uh, so the initial ideas are very uh, old. I talked about the paper introducing the first uh, neuron. Um, there was also the 62 paper on the perceptron. You can think of that as a neural network consisting of just one layer. And if you have a neural network consisting of one layer, it is basically an SVM or a logistic regression model, as we will see in a minute. Uh, then there were also these, let's say, theoretical papers uh, uh, showing the limitations of if you just have a, a single layer. So that also led to the idea that one should have more uh, layers much later. Uh, and then there were several, let's say, AI winters uh, that uh, well, there were high expectations of AI, but it did not really uh, work very well in practice. And so the promises was much bigger. Uh, than, uh, than what was actually possible. And as I said, this started to change uh, 15 to 10 years uh, ago. And you also saw that, let's say, uh, major players like Google, Apple, Amazon, etc. started to invest half heavily in this technology, uh, enabling things like uh, Alexa, Siri, and all kinds of other uh, uh, applications that did not exist before. It is also high on the political agenda. Also Germany is trying to invest heavily, uh, let's say, in this field because it sees that it is strategically important. Of course, I'm very afraid that we are now also creating expectations which are too high. That's why I'm often, let's say, uh, rather critical about the use of the term artificial intelligence uh, like a concept that's going to change everything. Uh, uh, there are still many areas in which uh, classical data mining techniques perform way better uh, than uh, neural networks. So I think this course hopefully helps you to take a more balanced standpoint uh, related to that. I will also show the weaknesses of uh, using these types of techniques. Uh, this is another view of the history. Yeah, so it started with uh, the first artificial neuron, the perceptron. Uh, there were these theoretical results. Uh, so later we will see what, the, what I mean here with the XOR problem. Then backpropagation, multiple layers were introduced, uh, uh, leading to, let's say, a technology that is widely applied and uh, uh, performs very well. This also led to the uh, Turing Award uh, of 2018 for these three persons. Uh, and this is like a reflection of the incredible uh, impact of neural networks in science, but also, let's say, in, in the real world, where these things are now uh, widely applied. Um, so what are the advantages of using artificial neural networks? The advantages are, uh, you can can characterize it a bit as a brute force approach, like a, gen a generic machinery which you just feed with lots of data and then does what it is trained to do. So the advantages are it can uh, model uh, also nonlinear functions, and you do not need to know exactly what shape the function should have beforehand. Uh, it is uh, generic and, and flexible, data driven. Uh, it works remarkably well on, on, let's say, unstructured noisy data. It can deal with all of these different uh, types of inputs, as also sound, video, images. Uh, uh, the training can be very expensive and very time consuming, but once the model is done, it can give, let's say, immediate uh, answers. Uh, so training takes a very long time, but then it is also ready to be applied. And when you apply it, there are no performance issues anymore. 
The disadvantages are that uh, you need to feed it. It's very data hungry. You need to feed it with many uh, examples. Uh, what is also uh, the training phase can be uh, extremely expensive. Uh, the technique is non-transparent in the sense that uh, you cannot open the neural network and look into it. Uh, so people today often talk about explainable AI, trying to correct this. But in the end, uh, a neural network is huge. It is just a collection of, of let's say, neurons connected by weight functions. Uh, you cannot really look at it. So sometimes it leads to very surprising results. I will show some examples later, uh, which also create uh, a feeling that people cannot really trust these technologies. Uh, in many cases, they will give the right answer, but nobody can really tell how it exactly uh, works. One can tell that in theory, but if you then uh, try to explain a particular decision, that is very difficult. There is a risk of overfitting uh, 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 the data. Uh, one should not apply it to, let's say, problems that are structured, and where you could use uh, uh, classical techniques much better. Uh, and they can be hacked. Uh, that, that is related to the topic of uh, non-transparency. Non so I'm showing these slides to make you aware that uh, uh, neural networks are in a way a brute force approach using weights and uh, uh, that you cannot open it and there, is no, there are no logical rules how it is doing this. I have uh, some slides that I took from a variety of papers, uh, but there are many more examples, showing how odd uh, neural networks can behave. So uh, this is a neural network that was trained on these 10 characters from 0 to 9. So uh, there was a data set consisting of just uh, characters, a neural network was trained on the data set, and then after uh, the training phase, uh, it was fed with these different pictures. And if we look at, for example, this first column, these four pictures are all four mapped onto zero. So the neural network says that each of these four uh, pictures says this is zero. If we look at four, then we, this is four, this is four, this is four, and this is four. While as a human, you would think, yeah, this has nothing. I, I would never conclude that this picture says four, right? Uh, but still, this neural network is, is based on, on the, it, its training results, is saying with 99.99% .99 confidence, this is a four. Here are some other examples. Uh, and these are, let's say, uh, like images that were deliberately created in such a way that the neural network would be fooled in, in thinking that it is something. And so for example, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, this picture that we see here is seen as a photocopier. Uh, this is seen as a car wheel. This is seen as a bagel. And uh, then, then we can kind of un understand it. Uh, this is seen as sunglasses. Uh, uh, this is seen as a fountain. Uh, in, in some of the pictures you can understand why, but there are other pictures where it's completely unclear why it would say this. Uh, so, for example, this is a green snake. So, this shows the problem. And you can deliberately hack uh, these things. So, what you see here is I'm showing you six pictures. Uh, let's say, for example, a picture of a bus, a picture of a dog. Uh, um, these pictures, if we uh, train a neural network and we uh, feed it with these pictures, then these initial pictures, so these three that we see here and the three that we see here in this column, these six pictures, when we uh, apply the neural network, they are all correctly classified. Uh, so, for example, for, on, for this picture, the neural network will say it's a bus. Now, what you see here is this is artificial noise added to this picture. So, the picture of this picture of a bus that we see here looks very similar to us, 
but if you would zoom in at the lower level of detail you will see that noise has been added to the pixels behind uh, this. So as a human we still see a bus uh, and here we still see a chicken and here we still see a dog and uh, basically for a human nothing changes uh, but the neural network that was trained on this data set uh, now recognizes all of these things as being an ostrich. And yeah, uh, if you know how the, what the weights in the neural network are, you can kind of, uh, you know what noise to add to make it conclude something that it is not. So this shows that you could kind of hack neural networks in such a way that uh, they have been trained uh, and yet you make it, these techniques deliberately make completely the wrong uh, conclusion. Here's another example. So uh, uh, if we hear the original image, then the neural network understands this sentence. And then we add a bit of noise. And uh, as a human, the noise is so limited that we that you cannot really tell the difference. But now the neural network understands this sentence. And so it understands something completely different than what it is shown before. There are many examples. And so for example, this is a duck. I add noise and uh, this duck is, uh, is classified as being a horse. Uh, there is this sound, how are you? I add some noise and it is translated in open the door. And this could in principle be used in a text. That's why this is an active area of research. I'm showing you this, that you have an understanding uh, that, that it's not really explainable why neural networks make certain decisions or not. Okay, so let's now uh, talk more about the relationship between artificial neural networks and, uh, and human neurons. Uh, if we look at our brain, our brain uh, consists of, of, of around 100 billion neurons. Uh, sometimes you lose a few billion uh, because of drinking uh, too much. Uh, but that's the complexity of the brain that we have. And these neurons are interconnected. And if we look at the, uh, let's say, lower level, yeah, so this is a neuron and this is a neuron, then you can see the different uh, ingredients. So we have dendrites, uh, we have this connection via the axon, uh, we have uh, synapses, etc., etc. The details are not uh, very important, but you have to think of them. They are small elements that have a certain state and that are able to, uh, to exchange uh, signals. And these signals are exchanged, of course, uh, using uh, chemicals. So uh, such a cell can fire and then it may generate a new, uh, a new signal for the, for the next uh, neuron. Uh, as I said earlier, I think the relationship between human neurons and artificial neurons, um, let's say there is a loose connection. And so one could argue that some of the ideas are very similar, but on the other hand, there are also, let's say, significant uh, differences. So what we see later is that these neurons that we see here, will be represented as something that has a bunch of inputs. Uh, these inputs have certain weights and that's kind of corresponding to the thresholds that you have here at this connection uh, between the uh, synapse and the uh, dendrites. Um, these weights are being summed and then if we are above a certain threshold, we generate a particular uh, signal or not. So that's the basic uh, idea. Uh, so, in this lecture, we will first look at uh, the neural network as being given. So we first talk about the architecture, uh, and only later we will talk about uh, uh, how we can use the same uh, technique that we saw in earlier lectures, that we try to reduce the error. And the mechanism that is being used in neural network is called backpropagation. As so using backpropagation, we improve the performance of the neural network on the large uh, collection of training examples that we use to train it. 
so this is a, another visualization of a, of a single uh, neuron. And I'm showing you this, that you can kind of see the shift from, let's say, the human neuron to the artificial neuron. Um, so we have a bunch of inputs, and you can think of them as synapses and dendrites. Um, we have certain inputs. Uh, these inputs are multiplied by a, by a specific weight. Then the cell body uh, computes a sum. And then uh, there is an activation function, F in this example, that converts this sum uh, uh, to an output. And F could, for example, be the sigmoid function uh, that we had seen in the context of logistic uh, regression. So what is confusing because, uh, as we have said, we are using notations from different books and different articles. Uh, this constant B here, you see that sometimes this B is represented uh, as a weight, and then uh, there is a different X0 uh, than here. Then we have an X0 that is by definition 1, and then uh, this B can be encoded as W1 times X0, and if X0 is 1 by convention, then you could think of weight 0 as being this constant B. And sometimes you see that this B is put separately, uh, sometimes it's not. So this is the basic idea. We have inputs, we take the weights, we sum them, we apply an activation function, and we generate an output that looks like this. So this is saying this uh, in text and also like how, how it tries to mimic uh, the human brain. So we get inputs, we assign importance to each input using the weight function. Uh, then we, the cell body is doing the summation. And then we translate this sum to, uh, let's say, an action using the activation function. Uh, so if we look at the single layer perceptron, this is, let's say, the most simplest, uh, let's say, neural network that you can imagine. It just has a single layer. So there is this paper that I uh, referred to, uh, to earlier uh, that is considered to be, let's say, a, land, a landmark in the field of uh, neural networks uh, uh, because it's first describing this architecture. So this is this, the basic idea. And if you look at this idea and you, you let's say, strip away, let's say, these, re these relations to, let's say, human neurons, uh, then you actually see this is nothing different from logistic regression and SVMs. Uh, the, the, the nature is very much uh, the same. Remember uh, what I showed you at the beginning. It looks very similar to what we are seeing here. Uh, so the simple... Uh, uh, the, uh, so so th this neural network consisting of just a single layer is called a perceptron. And uh, using a perceptron, we can, uh, let's say, train it to produce a certain output. We feed it with many examples and we try to reduce the error, just as it is before. So, uh, if we have, for example, uh, uh, like, uh, like this neuron with three inputs, like this is sometimes, what I said before, this is sometimes seen as B. Uh, so, we have this convention that there is this one uh, input that is 1. So we can think of 1 times W0 as the B, the constant B that we see in some other uh, uh, formulas. But we take the weighted input of uh, X0, X1, and X2. We apply function F to it, and we generate an output. So if we have these weights, so uh, W0 is minus 1, uh, w1 uh, is equal to half, w2 is equal to 0 0.3, and our input is 2 and 1. Note that this 1 is always 1, because it's considered to be a constant. We have two inputs, 2 and 1. Then by this neural network, uh, we first take the weighted sum, so 1 times minus 1, 2 times half, 1 times 0 0.3. So we sum that up, and that is equal to 0 
So here in the middle we compute 0 0.3 as the sum and then we apply function f, the activation function, that is converting this to, for example, the value 1. So uh, here we are assuming a threshold of 0. So if the number is positive, we return 1. If it is negative, we return 0. So this 0 0.3 is converted to 1 by this function uh, f. Here again we see the remark that sometimes we have to be and sometimes uh, not. So we feed it with many examples and based on these many examples we would like to, to predict uh, uh, a certain target feature. We can measure the error and we try to, uh, to reduce the error. So what are possible applications? Well, they are very much what I said before. So we can try to train the network to predict the disease by feeding it many, uh, let's say, labeled images of males and females. We can make the network uh, predict whether a picture is a male or a female. Uh, if we are feeding it with music, then we can train the network to distinguish, for example, country music uh, from metal, etc. Et this is a very generic uh, uh, technique that, is, that often has very surprising and spectacular results because you can feed it with this, unclassified, with this unstructured data, music, images, video, etc. Uh, so the activation function, so uh, on the slide before I was using this as an activation function. Uh, uh, however, uh, let's say later when we want to, uh, to, to reduce the error, let's say iteratively, we again go to functions like the sigmoid function. So remember why did we have the sigmoid function when we talked about uh, for example, logistic regression, is that we want to, uh, to squeeze the whole domain from minus infinity to plus infinity to something that fits on uh, the domain 0 or 1, where we, for the negative values we want to be close to 0, for the positive values we want to be close to 1, and for values that are somehow in the middle, we, we, we have values, let's say, really in between 0 and 1. So, for example, 0 0.5. Uh, and this is used for the gradient descent that we can see how we can reduce the error. Uh, in our examples, just to be clear, uh, so this is the computational device that will be used later, or variants of this, uh, to understand for the moment and to use in our examples where I want to avoid computing uh, something like this. Uh, we use uh, uh, the simple step function that if the value is negative we make it 0, if it is positive we make it 1, as I used before. So let's now uh, try to use this simple perceptron to uh, implement a couple of, let's say, uh, uh, logical functions. So here we would like to, uh, to have a perceptron that learns the inclusive R, yeah? so the normal R. So if, if both are zero, you can say interpret zero as being false. If we have two times false, the R returns false. Uh, in all other cases, it returns true. Yeah, so if, if x1 or x2 is true, in other words, is equal to 1, we return 1. So now we would like to implement this and we could create this simple neural network consisting of a single neuron where we have the weights uh, uh, w0 has minus half, w1 and w2 are equal to 1. And now we get this formula. Yeah, so if we look at the sum, it is equal to 1 times minus half plus x1 plus x2, because these weights are equal to 1. Uh, if that is uh, above 0, we return uh, 1. If it is below 0, we return 0. Yeah? So, so that's the basic idea. So, so let's, uh, let's see whether if we pick as weights Yes, so now I'm using the weights that I'm indicating here. Let's see whether it works correctly. So if I have 2 times uh, 0, 
then the result is minus half. It's below, uh, below zero, so we return false. If we now have the point 1, comma, uh, so x1 is equal to 1, x2 is equal to 0, uh, meaning that x1 is true and x2 is false, I fill out the values and I get, uh, let's say, 1 times 1 plus 1 times 0 minus half is a positive number, so it is, let's say, mapped onto 1. So this is mapped onto 1 and these two other points are also mapped onto 1. So you can see that this correctly implements uh, the inclusive R. Let's now try to, uh, to, to implement the end. So again, here we see our training examples. So please note, and it's important to not forget that, that x1 and x2 are, are uh, let's say, descriptive features, and y is our target feature. And these are the kind of the conventions that we are using here. Uh, now I have this uh, neural network. It looks very much the same. So uh, weights W1 and weight W2 are still equal to 1. But uh, weight W0, before it was minus half, now it's minus 1.5. So if you think about the line, we are kind of shifting uh, the decision boundary. So this is now our formula. Uh, if the value is lower than zero, we return uh, false. If the value is above zero, we return true, just as before. And what we see now is that this correctly implements the end. Yeah, so for example, if I take a look at this point. Yeah, so uh, here one of the two variables, x1, uh, x1 or x2, is equal to uh, one, the other is equal to zero. So this first part is evaluating to 1. Minus 1 and a half is a negative number. So this will be uh, uh, lead to a value lower than 0. So that is false. And so if one of them is true, or both, uh, or, or both of them are false, then we always get a value below 0. So we return false. We only return true if both are equal to 1. Yeah, so fill out 1 plus 1 minus half is half, which is above 0, so we return 1. I hope that the, 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 the game gets clear. So we have now the inclusive R, we have the AND. Let's now try to, uh, to implement the XR using a neural network. So we have these two examples. Yeah, that uh, you, they, they correspond to lines like where we are, uh, yeah, what's our separating plane. Um, so we had the, uh, the, 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 the inclusive R and we had the end, as you can see here. But now we want it to be the XR. So uh, we want this to be mapped onto false, onto zero. We want this. 1, 1, yeah, so both are true. We want that to be also mapped onto 0, in other words, on false. And only these two points here, we would like to map them onto true. Yeah, so precisely one of them should be true, and the other one should be false. Uh, so let's try to encode this. Yeah, so here I'm writing down what I would like, what the function should do. So uh, we do not know the weights, yeah, so the weights are unknown, but we know what the behavior should be given certain values of x1 and x2. So if both x1 and x2 are equal to 0, the value should be below 0. If, uh, 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 like if both are uh, 1, yeah, so both are true, it should also be below 0. If, one or if precisely one of them is uh, 1 and the other one is 0, only in these cases we want it to be above 0. And we are using, let's say, the activation function that we had before. So this is what we would like to have. And note that uh, we would like to compute weights in such a way that this holds. So what I now can do is I can simply fill out the values. Yeah, so if I fill out the value here, then x1 is 0, 
Okay, so I can remove this term. X2 is 0, so I can remove this term. So we can conclude that W0 should be lower than 0. Right? Uh, if I fill out these two values, then I see that W1 plus W, uh, sorry, W0 plus W1 plus W2, the sum of these three weights should also be lower than 0, etc., etc. So I can fill out all the values, and these are the things that I get. Yeah, so these are my constraints, because I know what the response should be given certain values of uh, X1 and X2. So if I do that, then uh, uh, I can basically combine these first two. Yeah, so if this is smaller than zero and this is smaller than zero, then the sum of these two uh, numbers should also be smaller than zero. Uh, I can do the same with this. I can also sum that up. And now we see that the sum should be both below zero and above zero. So here I'm showing, let's say, a proof. Well, proof is perhaps a big word. I'm showing a proof that uh, we cannot implement the XR using uh, a single layer neural network. Uh, so we need to have multiple layers. And this is a key insight that one uh, should have. So single layer perceptrons cannot uh, implement certain functions. Uh, but they can be realized if we uh, are using uh, multiple layers. Yeah, so uh, if we get nonlinear, more difficult structures, uh, like the one that I just showed to you, uh, then we need to, to resort to, to more layers. And this leads to the simple class of uh, feed-forward uh, neural networks that I'm going to show in a minute. This picture illustrates a bit that there is a like an explosion of, let's say, possible types of neural networks and possible topologies. And given the huge interest and the, the thousands of people all around the world working on this topic, there is kind of an explosion of, of architectures uh, in this. Uh, we will not cover these in these lectures. Uh, you can also take a dedicated uh, course in deep learning, uh, for example, by, with uh, Bastian Leibe, uh, to dive in this uh, into much more uh, detail. Uh, if you look at uh, convolutional neural networks, there's also a special let's say, type of uh, neural network architecture that is, for example, tailored towards uh, dealing with visible, uh, visible images. Because, of course, with images, uh, yeah, we are now treating them just as a vector of pixels. But, of course, you have pixels that are close to each other and pixels that are further away. So you can exploit uh, these characteristics. If you go to music, there are similar, uh, let's say, things in it, that things have a particular meaning. Uh, so convolu convolutional neural networks is a popular, let's say, architecture, also being able to deal with, uh, with images. Uh, uh, like a re related class is uh, the class of uh, LSTM uh, neural networks. These are recurrent but try to overcome some of the limitations of classical recurrent neural networks. And they are uh, basically looking at sequences of data rather than static data. When I talked about dog pictures, uh, yeah, basically, if I feed it one picture or another picture, I'm, I do not expect a neural network to somehow incorporate, yeah, you first saw this picture, so the next picture must be that. Uh, but in many data sets, for example, if you look at videos and if you look at event logs and all kinds of other things, or text, there is a particular order. So to illustrate this a bit, if I, have, if I look at the sentence, I lived in the Netherlands and speak perfectly, and then you would need to say something, then it's clear that uh, this word is kind of depending uh, to predict what word will be here, that is highly dependent on the fact that I was uh, talking about the Netherlands here. And, and somehow I can also conclude that I'm talking about languages. Uh, another more abstract example would be if I feed it with numbers, uh, then uh, it is not that the last number determines what the next number would be. Uh, 
uh, it depends on the whole sequence that we uh, see before. We could also look at time series corona data uh, sound. It is not that every next second of the music is completely independent of what was there before. The same holds for movement. So if there is this sequential nature in the data, then uh, LSTMs are a popular architecture uh, that have a kind of memory uh, uh, to, to capture this history in a convenient way, at the same time also forgetting the things that are not relevant. So in this lecture, we stick to uh, simple feed-forward neural networks. Uh, as I said, this is not uh, a course on uh, a deep learning only. This is a course on, on data science, and that's why you only need to, uh, to fully understand this basic type, but know about the existence of these other uh, types of networks. So uh, in such a feed-forward network, uh, we have different layers. We have an output layer, we have an input layer, and we have, uh, let's say, one or more hidden layers. And uh, 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 the directions of the arcs, as you can see in this network, are always going from the input layer uh, towards the, the output layer. Uh, so it goes from the input layer to the first hidden layer to the second hidden layer, etc., etc. So it has this clear acyclic, acyclic uh, architecture. Uh, what we see here on the left hand side is the uh, perceptron that we explained before. Uh, on the right hand side you see a two layer network, but the number of hidden layers, there's just one here. Uh, it could also be like 100. So here I'm repeating uh, what I showed before. And I'm repeating it because now I would like to implement the exclusive OR using uh, a neural network having multiple layers. Because I had shown before that if we just have one layer, I cannot implement uh, the inclusive uh, uh, OR, uh, the, sorry, the exclusive OR. Uh, so this is how we realize the inclusive OR. This is how we realize the, the, uh, the end. Uh, so we can implement an OR, we can implement an end, but we had difficulties implementing uh, the XOR. Uh, so here you see the end, the OR. Uh, this is an example also showing you how you can implement the NOT. Uh, so if W1 is equal to zero, then the sum is half. So that corresponds to true. Yeah, so, uh, if, however, the input x1 here is equal to 1, yeah, so if the input is true, then we will have uh, half minus 1 is lower than half, so we return false. Yeah, so this is implementing the not, and here you can see the exact function that is being used. So we have and, or, and not. So uh, that indicates that we can basically implement any Boolean function, but not in one step. We need to do it in multiple uh, steps. So I'm going to show you that uh, uh, looking again at the XR problem. So here I'm proposing uh, an architecture. And in this architecture, uh, this is what we want the behavior to be. Uh, uh, this is the network that I propose. So we have a hidden layer composed of two uh, neurons. We have an output layer uh, composed of just one uh, neuron because we, we, want, uh, we, we just want to have one uh, result. This is our activation function. Uh, so here I'm describing the complete problem. Uh, and the only thing that we need to do is to find weights for uh, uh, W0 until W8. Uh, so we have in total nine weights from W0 until W8. So I want to find values for these weights in such a way that this network uh, correctly, uh, let's say, classifies uh, these four possible inputs. So that's the basic uh, goal that we uh, have. 
And uh, this is a possible solution. Uh, there are, let's say, many other possible solutions. Uh, what I do here, perhaps we can first look at it here. As I said, we have uh, nine weights, W0 until W8. We all need to give them a value in such a way that the network uh, has the uh, desired uh, function. If we think of the exclusive R between X1 and X2, we can basically rewrite that like this. And so at least one of them should be true, but not both of them. And I think everybody can see that that is the way. So we build a network where we first compute this. And so we compute X1 or X2. And this is done by this neuron. And we are using the formula that we had seen before. And so we have minus half uh, for, for the constant. And then we have weight 1 for x1 and weight 2 for x2. Uh, so this is the R. We have seen that before. And so this is explaining uh, this weight, this weight and this weight. Uh, this neuron is computing the AND. And so we now look at x1 and x2. So that is this neuron. And if we look at this part, we have also seen that before. So again, uh, both of the inputs have a weight 1. And let's say our constant is minus half. So this explains this neuron. So uh, I, I now show you y1 and y2. That is the computation based on this. So y1 is equal to uh, x1 or x2. y2 is equal to x1 and x2. And now I apply this function. And this function corresponds to, let's say, this uh, neuron on the output layer, uh, where I have weight 1, weight minus 1, and weight minus half. Uh, and what does this do? I describe it here as the AND NOT. Yeah, so the AND NOT, because I take uh, the R value, and that should be true. So I give that weight 1. Then we have the AND value, that should not be true. So I give that weight minus 1. And then I have this uh, threshold minus 1, which is basically forcing that this should be 1, and this should be 0. Yeah, so if this is zero, it doesn't work. And if this is one, it also doesn't work. Because we would have a value uh, lower than zero. So here I've implemented uh, uh, this simple function. And you can see that it is possible. So this was a very particular example, just to make you used to the notation. And that you see that we can indeed implement uh, more complicated uh, things. The general structure looks like this, where the naming convention is that we have different layers. These layers have numbers. We typically indicate that with, uh, uh, with the number on top of the W. Uh, and then uh, every W is connecting one neuron to another neuron. And all the neurons in a particular uh, layer are again labeled from uh, one to the number that are there. Yeah, so for example, this is the, the first neuron in layer 1, second neuron in layer 1, uh, third uh, a neuron in layer 1. And then W1 uh, D3, the 1 is referring to the layer. Uh, uh, the D is now, D is a number. Uh, that's the uh, dimension of our input vector. And so we have d values in our vector. And so we have uh, uh, this weight is connecting the last element of the vector to the last neuron in the first layer. And this one is connecting the third neuron in the first layer to the third neuron in the, in the second uh, layer. As I hope that this notation is clear. Uh, that you can see how this works. As always, we have like these constants uh, connected to, to every cell. Okay, so 
that was a graphical representation, what we see here. The, we can rewrite that then in terms of functions and we see that this network is basically encoded uh, here. So we have the, let's say, first layer that is directly working on the inputs. Uh, and uh, this first layer consists of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, sorry, it gets input from every input and it goes to uh, each of the elements uh, uh, in the hidden layer. Yeah, so again, we are using this convention. So i is ranging from 0 to d, and i is running over our inputs. The j that you see here is bound here, and it is running over the neurons in our hidden layer. And there are, uh, it depends on whether you count the constant or not, uh, there are uh, m nodes in the in the hidden uh, layer and this weight is connecting uh, elements uh, let's say from this first layer to the to, to, to the second layer and there are uh, two activation functions so here this layer is using activation function f this layer is using activation function uh, h and here you can see an ex explanation of the of the symbols it is probably easier if you just look at the graphical visualization of this, uh, where you see the network. So in this layer, we are using activation function F. In this, func in this layer, we are using activation function H. What you can see is here that we are directly using the inputs from X1 until XD, where D is the number of dimensions in our input uh, vector. So we are using that as input. We take the weighted sum, as you can see here. Then we apply activation function H. Then we get uh, here these uh, M different uh, outputs. And they are fed to the, to the next layer uh, using the weights that we see here. If this is too difficult, please stop the video and, and make sure that you, you can make the mapping between the formula and the network that you see here. Uh, so this is the description of a two-layer uh, function, and you can think of the part that is highlighted here in red uh, as something that was before a separate uh, function. Yeah? Uh, Zj is the output of the, of the let's say, uh, first hidden layer. Uh, so this is nothing new. So this is the architecture that we use and we apply it to kind of unstructured data as, as we had seen before. In this lecture, I'm not going to explain backpropagation. And this will be discussed in more detail in the next lecture, but I would like to explain the basic idea. And so, because now, otherwise the story would be a bit hanging. I, I showed you magically how I got the weights. Uh, I just assumed that they were there suddenly, and uh, that may raise the, the, uh, the incorrect impression. So you could randomly initialize these weights, and then you need to train the network such that these weights converge to values that actually lead to correct uh, classifications. So uh, this is very similar to uh, the things that we have seen in the previous two lectures. Uh, we again can use an error function. And note that I'm uh, uh, taking again the error squared. And that has to do with, let's say, that we are then able to compute uh, uh, the, the derivative of the difference. So uh, tk is the actual value. And yk is the predicted value. There, uh, k refers to which output, and here we have output ranging from 1 to n. Yeah, so we have n outputs, uh, and for each of the outputs we compute the error, and that is the difference between what we saw in the data, so in our training e example, and what we predict. So the bigger the difference between what we predict and uh, uh, what is the real value, 
uh, the bigger the error and we sum over all the uh, k outputs. Note that this error is for a single instance and of course we can sum that up for all instances. And so uh, to, to visualize it, uh, in, uh, we, we feed it with an example vector. Uh, we know that corresponding to this example vector there should be this output, uh, but a neural network returns this and we simply compute the difference. So here this is in, in terms of numbers. So we have fed it with a particular instance. We know that for that instance, these are the target features, the features that the feature values that should come out. But the neural network is generating this. Um, then we simply compute the error. So we take the difference uh, uh, to the power two, uh, sum that up, divide it by two, and we get this uh, value. So nothing new. And now the goal is that we would like to reduce the error. That's very clear how we, we compute it. Uh, because of uh, the choice of error function, we can again compute uh, derivatives and we can, com uh, we can use the gradient descent uh, technique to try and lower uh, the error. And so, for example, it may be that because of the gradient descent, we decide that we need to increase the weight of this particular connection. How this works exactly will be explained in the next uh, lecture. So as before, I like I'm very much trying to connect the different uh, lectures. So we are using gradient descent. So we try to find the steepest way uh, down. Uh, again, there are problems like choosing a suitable uh, step size. And so again, there is lots of uh, parameterization and engineering uh, needed. But this is the basic mechanism that is being uh, used. And so uh, uh, we are now not doing this with a single neuron, like in the perceptron or in, in, in what we saw in logistic regressions. But in principle, we are doing it with thousands of neurons, having millions of connections. Uh, and for this whole network, we are trying to use gradient descent uh, uh, to come to the lowest point. I cannot stress enough that this uh, uh, neural networks, and this is a very particular example of error-based uh, learning. And the general principle of error-based learning is that uh, uh, you, you start with a random sample or random samples, and you iteratively try to improve it. This is a very generic approach. So if I would use the metaphor, for example, of, of, of genetic algorithms or other types of evolutionary algorithms, and you think of trying to find the lowest point, uh, then in genetic algorithms you would not, uh, let's say, start at one point, but you would start, I don't know, at thousands of different points, and you try to improve them using, for example, mutation and crossover uh, uh, to find the lowest point. Yeah, where where, uh, let's say, different solutions can be combined, etc., etc. This is all error-based learning, and it's important that uh, you get the bigger picture of all of these techniques. Um, so after we have trained the network, then the hope is that it will get these results. Note that the results will never be, let's say, very binary in nature. There may be some uh, uncertainty. So we can use things like uh, majority voting. Yeah, so here it basically says that the likelihood that this is a dog is higher than the likelihood that this is a cat, which is true. Um, we mostly focus on supervised learning, where uh, we know what the output should be. However, there are incredibly interesting tricks that you can do with these uh, uh, neural networks. And one of these tricks is using an autoencoder. So with an autoencoder, it's very, uh, let's say, it's a very uh, intriguing idea that you have input and you have output. And for example, you would like that the output is equal to the input. But you force it going through. Eh? So it would be trivial to, to build a neural network that would exactly do that. 
but you are using a neural network where the middle layer is small. So you basically push like a high dimensional input through uh, an inner layer that has few dimensions and then you explode it again into multiple dimensions. And you try to, to train the weights in such a way that this is working. Um, so to, to visualize this, so I feed it with an input 4. I want this to come out and I train the network in such a way that the network becomes better at, let's say, reproducing itself, going through a very, let's say, uh, a layer in the middle, a hidden layer, uh, that has a low number of dimensions. And then you're basically summarizing, um, uh, let's say, the essence of this character. And so many different fours will be mapped onto the same four that you see here. So you can, uh, you're basically reproducing the input. And these types of things, uh, we will come back to that in the lecture of uh, text mining because these things can be used to capture the meaning of a word, as we will see uh, there. So that's very intriguing. What is also intriguing is based on this input, you can generate outputs that have higher dimensions. So these things can, for example, also be used to, to create original art or create original music. Uh, uh, by that it is learning, let's say, these hidden layers that are able to reproduce uh, things. And so this is very intriguing, very exciting, and, and uh, it is opening the door for, uh, let's say, many interesting things that one can do with this technology. So, to come to a conclusion, uh, the building blocks of neural networks are in essence exactly the same as what we have seen in logistic regression and SVMs. Uh, it is also based on the idea of uh, iteratively reducing the nature, uh, reducing the error. Uh, it is inspired by nature, but yeah, the connection is rather weak, I would say. Uh, error reduction is done by using gradient descent, but this will be the main topic of the next uh, lecture. Uh, the advantage is that it can be used on, uh, on, on images and sound and all kinds of other unstructured data. The drawback is that uh, uh, the training time may be very time consuming and it's also very data hungry. If you just have a few examples, uh, such technique will uh, generate complete uh, bogus uh, results. Another draw drawback, as I explained uh, uh, before, is that uh, you cannot really verify or look at the model. It can be used for unsupervised learning, but the way that we framed it in this lecture, we focus mostly on supervised uh, learning, because unsupervised learning comes, uh, let's say, later in this course. So this is where we stand now. So we started with neural networks, and this will be continued in the next uh, lecture. See you then.